I'm Joe Devine, welcome to Whiteboard Football Extra. Today, I'm joined by James Montague to talk about the recent video series he wrote for the UMAX at Football YouTube channel, all about the Premier League's wealthiest owners. The series was called Meet the Billionaires, and detailed the histories of Stan Kroenke, Taksin Shinawatra, Roman Abramovich, and Sheikh Mansour. The Sheikh Mansour video is the final installation of the series and is due to be released on Friday of this week. Today, I got the chance to dig a little bit deeper with James. Mostly we talked about motivation. Uh, I was curious to understand more about why these men bought football clubs in the first place. Um, And we also talked about the difficulty of being a football fan and maintaining your morals. This is off the back of James recently releasing a book called The Billionaires Club. So if you've enjoyed this video series uh, and you like this podcast, I would thoroughly encourage you to go and buy a copy of it. All good bookshops, the internet, etc. Before we get started with the interview, I just want to remind everyone that as of November, UMAXI Football is becoming TIFO. I will be blanketing podcasts, videos and articles with that information, so hopefully as few people as possible get to November and are confused as to why they are subscribed to something they've never heard of. Um, I'll also be issuing an apology every time I say it, for those of you who will no doubt hear me say it over and over again. Uh, So sorry and thank you. And that's all, so enjoy today's episode. Of the four billionaire owners we've covered in these videos, it strikes me that Taksin Chinawatra was the only one whose motivations for buying a Premier League club may have openly involved liking football as a sport. You don't necessarily get that impression so much from the others. Um, Would you agree with that, James? I think so. I mean, if you look at Abramovich, there's no doubt that he's an incredibly engaged owner um, and that he has grown to love Chelsea Football Club. Um, He certainly wasn't a fan before he got there. It was just the most expedient, the best fit for what he wanted, the quickest possible purchase. Um, And when I was researching it, in a way, Thaksin Sinawatra was a kind of... I mean, he obviously was... He represented a lot of the new world. The fact that he was a foreign investor, the fact that he was a billionaire from a growing kind of economy, uh, a tiger economy. Uh, but also, it, it was a little bit of a connection to the past, which was the fact that it was it was also ego, and that was that was a kind of a reassuring thing in a way. Everybody else's motivations were opaque, or in some cases blindly obvious, but nothing to do with football. And here you have Taxi Sinawatra, who's a you know a populist politician, and populist politicians you know feed off the off the crowd they feed off the adulation of of the people that have got them into the place that they 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 are and it was clear that football provided the same drug it was the same drug to him that politics provided him and um you know you can you can say that that is a a scary thing or a kind of um something that shouldn't be involved in football but i found it quite reassuring because that's something that we all recognize you talk about uh, Abramovich there learning to, to love football and, and clearly is a very engaged owner, as you say. And it strikes me as well that that's one of the things that often comes up in arguments between Chelsea fans and Manchester City fans, uh, as an example, where if they're you know talking about each other's owners. One of the things that a Chelsea fan might regularly say is Abramovich clearly loves the club. He's there at every game. You can see him engaged. Whereas uh, Sheikh Mansour, as you mentioned in, in the Sheikh Mansour video, has only been to one home game in, in nine years. And so it's clearly very important to, to fans that uh, their owners are invested or, or engaged in the sport itself. How important do you think that's going to be going forward for football? And, you know, is that going to be an issue if there's a lot of uh, absent owners? Well, I don't think it is actually that much of an issue uh, because if you look talk about Man City fans, you know, they're not complaining that he's not there. They're... they're they, Sheikh Mansour has transformed that football club that was not long ago in the equivalent of the third tier, um, you know, an also ran team as well. hadn't enjoyed set success for decades and had turned, have to turn them into multiple Premier League winners, uh, regulars in the Champions League. So nobody's complaining about the fact that he's not there. It's kind of accepted. It's like, yeah, well, that's part, that's part of his foibles. That's part, that's his, it's his right as the owner of the football club. And I think the fact that Chelsea fans do point to that with Roman Abramovich, I think is a kind of way of assuaging their guilt in a way, because you know, yeah. if you think about what he is and where he's come from and why he's bought the club, which is, you know, which is it's down to the brass tacks of the issue is the fact that this guy isn't buying it because he's a, a diffident, young, rich man that's got time in his hands and wants to build a successful kind of thing. He, do, he doesn't need it for, for profit. You know, this is, you know, 
a way of of spending money, moving money, and also of of providing kind of cover, I think, to keep his money. And you know, th- th- these are awkward questions, and and fans have to when they have a successful owner that doesn't have perhaps the moral authority of the owners of the past or some of the owners of the past remember they had ken bates beforehand and he he wasn't a very liked character either although ironically in the billionaires club i mean i think ken bates comes out of it although he's not a billionaire i mean he's integral to the story of how bramovich comes to chelsea i think he comes out of it quite well because um ultimately one of the things that he puts in in place is the chelsea pitch owners which is because there was, I mean, Chelsea fans will know this, uh, especially older Chelsea fans, about the battle uh, over who actually owned the land under which uh, Stamford Bridge was uh, was sitting on. And this, you know, I mean, it, it looked like they were going to lose their stadium on several occasions, you know. And once it was back under control, once the leasehold of it was under the control of, of, uh, of Bates, you know, he set up this kind of non-profit organisation that effectively... Um, has supporters who own the the name of the club and and the turnstiles and the, and the ground under which the stadium is. Who Amazing really part of the deal for you know the new stadium as well. We're involved heavily in that. Absolutely, and you know Abramovich tried to get around it and uh, tried to persuade the uh, stakeholders of that organisation that this is you know we need this back for the good of the club, and they stood firm. And so that's why it's kind of being rebuilt there and not being built in, say, Battersea Power Station or other op- options that were, that was, that were kind of given. Um, but anyway, sorry, I digress. I mean, we go, go back to Abramovich. And yeah, I mean, um, for many fans, it's, it's, it's you know, the, you have to make these kind of, you have to jump through these moral hoops. And, and this, this gives comfort, I think, to a lot that say, look, I mean, he, he loves the club. He's one of us. And... Um, and, they, and they will continue to follow that until it goes wrong. I mean, it might never go wrong. I mean, he, might, he may well, there might be a seamless transfer, maybe even to his son. I mean, Abramovich's son has been, apparently, according to reports, um, looking into buying in CSKA Moscow, you know, it's kind of this dynasty of football club uh, owners, billionaire football club owners. So, and, that, and, that's, and that's something that came out of the book as well, is that, Often it's not about the the owners, and even when it goes wrong with those owners, sometimes it's about who the owners sell to. Where it goes, that's the problem. That's when things can ever arrive. And it'll be interesting to see. I mean, it'd be interesting to see what his true legacy will be after he's sold. So I think it takes a couple of generations until it's until it's obvious. Unless you're Portsmouth FC, of course, when it all happened in about three years. Mm. I think maybe one of the most interesting things that came out of the Abramovich video that we made uh, was when you talk about. You, you, how I think you sort of just mentioned it there as well, but his motivation for buying the club and maybe one of those motivations might have been to create a an international non threatening reputation and perhaps at that level of publicity might you know act as a preventative measure for anyone who might want to act against his interests. It's funny that we talk about fans uh wanting to defend those things and you know using the example of him being at the club every week as a way to maybe assuage some guilt, as you say. I mean, is it, is it not possible to, to exist in both positions at once, though? I mean, is it not possible, for example, to be a Manchester United fan and benefit from the, the, you know, the Glazers spending money on, on Lukaku this year, for example, and at the same time say, this, this, isn't, this isn't OK? Um, yes, make of you course. A I uh, no, I don't, think, I don't think so. I mean, I, it, you know, I am a West Ham fan and, you know, I am also acutely aware i watch the matches uh i mean I, I i don't live in england so it's very difficult for me to get to watch the matches i mean i only went a couple of times last season but um you know i i, I watch the matches i consider myself a fan i uh buy merchandise i mean you know my daughter has a west ham baby grow um <laughs> you know I, I don't think that makes me you know it's, I'm, I'm not a season ticket holder but um you know <laughs> If you look at those owners, you know, and if you look at the stadium deal that went down, something that I mentioned later on in the book, uh, even looking at the morality of how Sullivan and Gold made their money, um, you know, of course, there is some level of hypocrisy there that I haven't kind of, you know, thrown this club away and said, this is this is immoral for me to, to support you. But that's that undermines the kind of central tenant of what it is to be a football fan, which is this is kind of your club through thick and thin. Um, of course, in the most egregious examples of, of um, 
you know, immorality with come when it comes to ownership or f- for other issues within a football club. You know, fans have to stand up and uh, and take that on. But I think, you know, I think it's uh, it's a, a little bit of hypocrisy is kind of accepted because you can't you can't just you can't just change you can't you can't get it out of your blood. Um, but I, I do think that it's problematic that you know just sitting back and saying, you know. It, I'm absolutely fine spending this amount of money on, you know, our defence this season, knowing some of some of the kind of human rights issues, especially of Manchester City. And there's also another issue, which is the morality issue, which is something that, you know, I've been criticised quite a lot for making a big play of, uh, like being a bit of a killjoy. But I think there is a big issue to be, a difference to be made between the American kind of ownership, uh, or the American owners, that have, especially in the Premier League, and Manchester City and PSG. Uh, you know, mm. there isn't anything... Although the Glazers and the financial instruments they use, um, the, the leveraged buyout and the way that they have taken out, you know, I mean, by one count, over a billion pounds over the course of the 10-year period that they, they, they purchased the club. Um, you, you know, there is a moral element to that, but I, I still don't think that that is even... That it doesn't even scratch the surface when it comes to a country whose system is built on kafala or the democra- uh, dem- uh, democratic deficit in that country or uh, mm. widespread use of torture. Um, you know, uh, these and these aren't far, these these aren't far removed issues from from the owners. I mean, they're very, they're very directly linked to them. You know, these are these are people within the government that is creating the policy where this is happening. You know, yeah. um, and so I think that there is there is a there is a difference in in those kind of things and. But it's very difficult. It's def- it, you can't be pure. You can't be pure because, you know, uh, whatever way you look at it, that club has its tentacles, has its roots deep in your soul. And you, and you, can't, you can't just shake those no matter how bad the situation gets. That's interesting that you say that, actually, because one of the questions I was going to ask you was about um, you being slightly more direct in, in the video uh, about Sheikh Mansour, which uh, for listeners is, is actually out later on this week, so they won't have seen it yet. But it struck me that you were slightly more observational in your discussion of, of the things in, in the first three episodes. And obviously, you know, there was Shinawatra, his situation in Thailand and the coup, Abramovich benefiting from the, the breakdown of, of Soviet Russia and Kronke shifting the St. Louis franchise. There's a, there's, there's a slight degree there, I suppose, with his involvement with, with Walmart and, and wages and, and general inequality, but it did seem that you were much more direct uh, uh, in your criticism, I suppose, about these sorts of negative issues when it came to Mansour. And I suppose that is in part as, as a result of what you were just saying, right? Well, in... I mean, in a way, the other three names that you mentioned had been um, spoken about, and it was, there was a degree of knowledge whether people took, you know, uh, had acted on it. I mean, certainly with Cronky, um, uh, people in America aren't surprised at all by what's happening at Arsenal. Arsenal fans seem to be, you know, as if it's the first time like that this is kind of the, this is new behaviour for him, you know. But it was kind of it's kind of out there. Same with Abramovich. I mean, everyone 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 kind of knows. Um, a little bit of the backstory. I, th- I think with the book, I think what it fleshed out a little bit is perhaps people not realising just how enmeshed he is in this network of oligarchs that kind of do the bidding for Vladimir Putin, um, wh- whether that's in economics or politics or sport. And usually Usmanov and Abramovich are, are in both cases. And in Taksin Sinawatra, you know, of course, he was um, in part, part of the controversy was his human rights records. Um, which was a huge issue that he he passed the owners what he's now the owners and directors test, but commonly known as the fit and proper persons test. Um, he, you know, this this was a a pretty well known issue. What the reason why I'm I guess I'm a bit more direct with Sheikh Mansour is that I think that I lived in the United Arab Emirates and I and I saw for myself for many years what the reality of that system of government was for for the. You know, I mean, there is a it's a form of apartheid that that is in that country uh, when it comes to the way that uh, Asian workers, in particular Asian workers, men and women, are treated by that by that system. Um, but the fact that it was not spoken about, you know, you never read uh, anything about this connection between Manchester City, its owner, the government, and what what it did there. There's very cursory. I mean, even 
I mean, I'm a big fan of David Conn's uh, work, and he's, of course, he's a famous Manchester City fan. You know, but even in Greater Than God, it was it was a kind of um, uh, sorry, Greater Than God, Richer Than God. Even in Richer Than God, it, uh, you know, which is a great book, but you know, it, I think it undersells the the the, the kafala system and the kind of damage it does to people's lives. And for me, that was that was something that needed to be brought out a bit more. Uh, and I think it's important that that not just supporters but everybody involved knows that this is this is the reality of of what's going on and it's a far more complex complex situation so i guess it's it's having more knowledge of it for one and also you know it being a kind of an un, an untold story i thought you mentioned uzmanov there as well um and i was going to talk to you uh, about him because one of the the gripes of, of of arsenal fans generally and aside from you know these sort of background issues is that that Kronke has uh, too much of a handle on the club's finances. They don't spend enough money, and there's a, there's a sort of movement within certain uh, elements of the fan base, I suppose, to to move Kronke aside and bring Usmanov in. But I suppose you're just getting rid of one set of issues and, and bringing in another with Usmanov, right? Yeah. So in in many respects, yeah. I mean, this is this is part of the the kind of moral uh, issue that many, and uh, you know, I, I had this. I've, it was probably in the book expressed best by the two Arsenal fans I met in the Amsterdam Tavern in St. Louis. Um, you know, and it was like, you know, they talked about the kind of slave owning uh, Middle Eastern oligarchs or the kind of former Soviet kind of uh, oligarchs from, from Russia. How, how do you want to be ethically compromised? And, you know, Arsenal fans have got that issue as well. I mean, Kronke has done, you know, of course, the, the whole Walmart thing, uh, if you look at his personal behaviour and how he he acts when it comes to um, his assets, you know, ev- evicting low income families from his um, uh, Texas estate that he bought, which was what makes him one of the biggest landowners in the US. And you know, there was a famous example of somebody killing themselves because they didn't have a home, and they named him in his suicide note. These kind of things. I mean, these are all kind of personally, I think, very kind of damaging uh, types of stories and very telling about somebody. Um, but you know, uh, Arsenal fans have got a very difficult <laughs> choice, really, because then you've got Usmanov, who they're kind of very keen. A lot of fans like get get Kronky out, get Usmanov in, and and this is what like the two mics at the Amsterdam Tavern had, had absolutely crystallised was you know how do you want to be ethically compromised? And then you've got you've also got Dangotti, the the Nigerian cement uh, billionaire, supposed billionaire uh, or alleged billionaire, you know, and. It, yeah, it, it, I mean they're all they're all leaps into the unknown. Um, they're all leaps into the unknown, and uh, in a way, you think you know better the devil you know. Because I mean, Kroenke is about stability. You know, he's not about overspending. He's not necessarily about underspending either, because he doesn't want his asset degraded. But it's about keeping a steady ship. And you worry that you know when Wenger goes and if he goes, what 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 fate will or before Arsenal. We talked a little bit about the motivation of, of the owners, and that seems to me to be you know, the key point of, of curiosity in the whole situation. Often I think it's implied that, that it's all about power or boredom or maybe ego, as you suggest. But interestingly, you mentioned in the Sheikh Mansour video that uh, he was quoted as, as saying something along the lines of football in, in the Premier League is, is a world-class entertainment and it seemed a sensible investment for him to make mm. when he bought Manchester City. But given the amount of money that he's spent uh, since he's arrived and the fact that in 2008, at the time of purchase, football wasn't really a profitable business, it's a slightly odd statement to make. Do you think that that, that, that he or some, maybe some of these other men as well had some foresight uh, in the future of the game um, and you know could could predict that the current state of affairs was going was gonna to happen? And, and if that's not the case, then how do, how do we assess those sort of motivations? I think you could say both in a way. I mean, uh, there's no doubt that the, um, he's, in terms of his investments outside of football, um, you know, he has made billions, billions of pounds um, in his investments and especially uh, by chairing the IPPC, which is the second biggest sovereign wealth fund in the United Arab Emirates. Um, has, of course, uh, he's you know has an acute business mind i mean there's there's, there's no doubt about it um but saying that investment in football uh was was some some kind of uh you know profit motivation 
I mean, it's utterly ridiculous. I mean, even at the level of an NFL team, um, you know, we're still talking a drop in the ocean compared to what states have and what they make in their investments. These are, these, this, this isn't something um, that, that, I mean, it will, it will take so long. I mean, maybe if they sold sold the club eventually, they might then make back what they've spent. But that's all that hard work, all that uh, time and effort of building a club over 10 years to sell it and then to be back where you started. So for me, that was also a starting point, whereas you hear people talking about profit and, you know, these people make know how to make profit and they'll have advisors that will tell them, if you want to make profit, you do not... If you want to think about the amount of time against the amount of profit you're getting... Football club ownership would not be anywhere near the top 100 businesses you want to invest in. And I think that, no. you know, um, David uh, Goldblatt uh, in his last book wrote a great, I think I quote him in the, in the start of this, you know, which is in relative terms, um, you know, football clubs are pygmies, economic pygmies. You know, the, the, their turnover is equivalent to kind of your average uh, busy uh, Tesco's metro supermarket, you know. And, and so there is an element of that that, the issue now is, I think, that it's all a case of relativity. You've got, on the one hand, you know, businessmen who, you know, the, the, these figures are a drop in the ocean. So, you know, you have to wonder about their motivations. On the other side, you have, you know, people who it is, um, you know, it is a business and it is a profit motivation. And you can see that certainly with North American owners. Um, yeah. This is something. Um, the other point, and I think you, that you, you picked up on it there, saying that... Um, did they have the foresight to see that this is uh, uh, something that could be massive? We don't know how big this will go. We don't know whether it will crash. I mean, potentially, this you know, there's a lot of growing to go when it comes to the international football industry as a market. You know, and so there, you know, I, I have no doubt that there was a that there was some kind of idea, but you know. That's the frightening thing. Everybody talking about it as an entertainment product. I mean, Sheikh Mansour mentioned it in 2008 as an entertainment product. Um, you know, if you look at Jack Ma, the guy, the you know, one of China's wealthiest guys who invested in Guangzhou Evergrande, you know, he invested in it because entertainment product. You look at the Americans inventing in, investing into an entertainment product. So, yeah, I mean, it is, they do see it as a, you know, not necessarily as a sport, but, you know, as I mentioned in the book, as a kind of almost a TV series that doesn't really end. And and so, yeah, there is... So we don't know how far it can go. So there is an element of it that maybe there was some kind of foresight, but for the most part, um, you know, there is absolutely no way that any business advisor would have told Sheikh Mansour in 2007, 2008, you're buying a football club, right, great, that's a great business idea, mate. Yeah, you put in... You're a really busy guy. You put in all your hard work into that, Great, you know you're gonna you could prob- you might make a small profit of a couple of million pounds. He probably spends that on his holiday on a, on a, on a day. You know, I mean, it's it's just not feasible. And when I hear yeah. that, that's what sets the alarm bells ringing because I'm then I'm thinking, well, what is the real reason? That's the thing. I think, given all that, you have to assume that there are other motivations because otherwise, it seems to make no sense at all. Um, after all of that, then I suppose, and given you know the current state financially of, of the Premier League, is it really possible? Uh, you know, now or in the future, to have an uncompromising or an ethically uncompromising owner. I mean, there are, you know there are good examples of very. Ri- I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, I don't hate the rich uh, in their entirety, um, <laughs> but you know, there are examples of very good uh, clubs with with owners who can, who care who clearly care about the team. I mean, if you look at. Huddersfield, if you look at Middlesbrough, obviously not in the Premier League. I mean, at a certain extent, Brighton, although the owners, uh, how he's made his money can be, I mean, you know, a lot a lot of kind of, let's say, English or uh, local kind of owners in, you know, they seem to have made their money in, in online gambling. And I think that equally, if you take a moralistic angle, I think is, is also incredibly damaging uh, business to be to be involved in. But... You know, there are people who run their clubs well, who seem to love their love the teams, and so you, I suppose you you, you can. Um, the issue is that this will this will continue to uh, remove the game and the clubs from their local environments, and, and in, by extension, the fans uh, until there's until something goes horribly wrong, and that's what happens individually at every club. Look at Portsmouth, for example. Um, you know it, that that's when. Uh, 
the fans or whoever will be left Will be. I mean, it sounds a little bit like an apocalyptic zombie f- movie, you know, because the few survivors on Earth, whoever's left, kind of rebuilds from the ashes, you know. Uh, and and there, is, there is an element of that, you know, that, that, that whoever's left is going to have to rebuild the game because, you know, it, it, it can't carry on like this. Um, and not just I, that either. I'm just sorry to interject, but I think with the Portsmouth one in particular, uh, there's, there's a sense, you know, from some people that they would they would think okay it's 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 not great the thousands of fans have have lost what was you know known as their football club but also it, the the club was inextricably linked to the local economy you know there were there were a bunch of businesses around you know even down to the level of businesses that benefited from there being that much uh foot traffic towards the stadium yeah. Uh, yeah. and you know there was this, this there was this issue when the Berlin ground closed as well there were loads of traders around there who's businesses and 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 lives were totally changed uh as a result of the club moving and so if you you know see the the collapse of a business on on that level uh the effect it has on a local area can be really devastating well i mean also don't forget that with foot, when a football club goes down um you know you have the football creditors rule which obviously pays out uh the debts to those you know players uh, wages um, anybody connected to the club but the, the businesses that they owe money to the local businesses um, and, and then by extension the tax man who, who's, who's the last to see a cut of it um, uh, which is why HMRC you know are so uh, on football clubs at the moment because they, they, they see them as a vehicle for you know defrauding the exchequer effectively you know and so mm. so that yeah the local community is usually the last in the suppliers are the last people to to get anything out of, out of a club when it goes down and you know it, it, it will take i think you know it will take not not just one club at a time where it happens i think it, it, it there'll be a critical point where either let's say china changes tack i mean one one issue that i put in the book is all this chinese investment could be a very short-term thing because it's largely being driven from the top. And what happens when Xi Jinping leaves? You know, the next person that comes in might not be a big football fan um, and might not see it as a central pillar of investment. Or maybe they have a more isolationist president next time. And all this investment will be gone. And what will be left behind? I mean, it won't be an orderly withdrawal. You know, it will be it will be a Dunkirk-type evacuation. And what will be left of those clubs? And... And like I said earlier, that's what that's that's the scary thing. Is it's not when things are going well. I mean, no, very few people were, um, you know, critical of Gaydamak at Portsmouth when things were going well. I mean, it was a manageable debt. It was you know, success on the pitch. It was Premier League. It was um, you know, it was, it was it, you know, you could just about keep your head above water. It's what happens next. It's who they sell it to, and and then and then what happens and. And, I, and you totally know, uncontrollable external influences, I think, is is the key in that situation. Uh, yeah, as well. I mean, and and that's and that's. I mean, with Portsmouth in particular, I mean, it was a it was a effectively uh, a series of very unscrupulous businessmen uh, using it as a kind of way of settling scores and debts amongst themselves. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's it, it. You know, I hope that when it when this happens, if this happens, but when it happens. Um, when there is going to be this correction, I think in the market and in the game, that that will be the that will be the opportunity to try to reorder the kind of regulatory framework because it's, it's clear that UEFA, you know, cannot stand up to the power of the big clubs, um, you know, without without provoking them to leave and creating their own kind of European or global super league outside of that structure. Yeah, um, and and how could they really as well? I mean, you you, you mentioned in the in the Mansour video that he uh, invested over a billion pounds uh, in a fund to to help Barclays Bank during the bailout. I mean, that really puts, I suppose, it puts it into into context, like how how wealthy that man really is. Like, how yeah. how can you, I suppose, well, it stand wasn't, up in opposition to someone like that? Exactly, and it wasn't entirely sure whether this was done as a personal investment or if it was done through the the his uh, the UAE's kind of sovereign wealth investment for one of the investment vehicles. Um, but certainly, there's all sorts of controversy about that deal as well, um, and there's c- current court cases going on about um, about that. But you know, I, I often think of that kind of that. Mo- I mean, there was this. If you look at like a money ball. Um, not Moneyball, sorry, what's the other book? Uh, the Big Short by Michael Lewis. You know, his conclusion at the end of this, 
And you see it a little bit in the film where, uh, is it Gillian from, oh, what's, she was in um, Doctor Who. And also, what's her name, the actress in that. And she plays, like, she's, part, she's from the regulator that's supposed to be overseeing um, uh, yes. all, all, yeah. all this investment. And, and um, in the end, you know, she just wants a job at one of the big banks. So it's completely rolled over. And in public policy terms, it's captured. You know, and this is the thing, capture. Because, you know, these, these are people in regulatory bodies who are usually the worst paid. You know, if they could get a job, if they were good enough, they would be getting paid, you know, a seven-figure salary at Goldman Sachs. But they're not, and that's why they're the regulator. And there's no safeguarding either if the, the banks choose not to work with those uh, with the regulators if they can think they can get a better uh, rating from, from another. Exactly, and there's that as well. But there's one, there's one um, issue that he talks about, uh, which is you should be, you know, we've got it topsy-turvy. We should be paying the regulators in any uh, industry. Cause, and, and a regulatory framework around industries, like privatised industries, is the hallmark of this kind of Thatcherite, Reagan, Reagan, Reaganite kind of 1980s, economy you privatize and then your oversight is this kind of quango economy but the problem is is in those quangos you need to have the smartest guys in the room you know you need to have the poachers turn gamekeepers and the only way you do that really is paying them a million pounds a year but that is politically poisonous saying that you're going to have these regulatory bodies that are going to cost kind of hundreds of millions of pounds a year but that is the that's only the, way to the stop pay it. the pay the president more argument right yeah that exactly it you know you've got to You've got to have, you know, you've got to have an Elliot Ness character in this. And you cannot see that happening at UEFA. You cannot see that happening at the FA. You cannot see that happening at the Premier League. But that's what you need, you know, because you cannot compete with the lawyers that Manchester City and PSG can buy. I mean, does anybody really believe that the when it comes to financial fair play that because of the two purchases that... The, Qatar have just made, okay, sorry, slip of the tongue. PSG has just made. Um, that we we honestly think that they're going to they're going to be prevented from entering the Champions League. I mean, the legal bills that will be generated uh, in fighting that decision are going to are going to be kind of bigger than the GDP of some you know European nations. Uh, so it, it's you know they've always got better they've got better lawyers but we need to be in a position where we have the smartest people in the room regulating these these industries and not seen as an afterthought and uh, finally i just wondered um how the response to the book has been i has been i mean i'm i was a bit scared when it when it came out because uh it was so i, I couldn't work out who it was for like it's it's like maybe fans aren't going to be particularly happy with it and uh you know it's quite a downbeat book i guess in many respects but um I mean, I hope there's some humour in it as well. But uh, it's actually been really, really positive. Um, more positive than for any of my other books. It's, it's been... I mean, it, it helped that it came out just as PSG uh, and the Neymar thing. And it seems to be people are kind of... Uh, you know, they're so fed up with the way... Not just the game's going, but the world's going. Because it's not really... A, it is a book about football. And it is a book about uh, the billionaires in football. But it's also a book about you know the billionaire class is about the super rich and and about inequality in the world and you know i think these are things that people could have recognized and they recognize it slipping away from them um and so it's been really really positive i mean the the, the best re- reaction i got was from arsenal fans and i was really you know i mean there hasn't been much pushback from city fans yet although i'm waiting for it maybe they're still reading it but the but the arsenal fans were uh, i went on the ask cast uh, podcast and I, I've never known a reaction like it. My mentions are just kind of going crazy. Um, because, I mean, it, it doesn't, you know, of course, they're very unhappy at the moment with Wenger, with underinvestment, and therefore, by extension, Kroenke. But, um, yeah, it's been, it's been wonderful. I, uh, you know, I went, on, I went on BBC Breakfast, which, when's you that ever going to happen again, you know? <laughs> I accidentally saw that. I was, uh, I was on you can't, you can't unsee um, it. I, yeah. No, I can't unsee it. But no, it was, it's, it's funny. It was, it's, I often find that whenever I go on holiday, it's probably the only time I will ever watch BBC Breakfast, you know, waiting for other people to get ready to go out. And then all of a sudden, James Montague just appears on the, on the big red couch. There you go. So, excellent, and, uh, excellent performance. Uh, James, thanks so much for, uh, for for doing the podcast, and also thank you for a wonderful collaboration with with the videos. I know that it's gone down really well uh, with the subscribers and stuff. Would you like to, to to tell listeners and viewers and stuff where uh, they can follow you on Twitter, where they can buy the book, or anything else you'd like them to know? Uh, yeah, I mean uh, Twitter, 
at James Piotra. Um, you can find me on there. All my stuff's on there. Or my website, jamesmontague.com. Uh, and yeah, the Billionaires Club. I mean, I would say uh, all good bookshops, the ones that are left. I mean, Amazon, boo. <laughs> uh, you can find it on there too. And uh, it's out in the US uh, eight, uh, October 24th. So, um, okay. so I'm not sure. I'm not sure how how American uh, readers will, will respond to the to the Cronky thing because I mean I suppose that's a well well worn trope over there. But there's uh, mm. there's there's a great guy. I would re- I would urge all of your readers when it comes especially to to the American ownership uh, scandals that are going on over there. There's a guy called Neil DeMouse, uh, and he he uh, wrote a book called Field of Schemes, and I think that's his his Twitter account. And he he kind of details all the kind of shady um, deals that are going on. Uh, trying to get tax dollars out of states to pay for kind of baseball stadiums and basketball arenas and NFL kind of stadia. And uh, often all these people we're talking about are now investing heavily in English soccer. So I would, I would, I would heavily recommend that people find him as well. Great. Okay, James, thanks so much. Speak to you again soon. Thanks. There we have it. Thanks to James for joining me. Uh, it was so much fun to be involved in the video series. I'm delighted to be able to say also that James has agreed to stick around with Umaxi uh, slash Tifo and continue to work with us making new videos for the channel. So hopefully we'll be able to make a few additions to the Meet the Billionaires playlist in the coming weeks. And excitingly, James will also be contributing to our editorial site. So more information on that as it comes in. Lots of articles and interviews, hopefully. Um, thanks, everyone, for downloading the podcast. Thank you for listening, if you've made it this far. And uh, we'll see you next week. Music.